Last week we had our first session pertaining to the preparation for Ramadan. We spoke about the virtues and the many opportunities that there are in this blessing for us to gain mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and for us to gain closeness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the aim of that lecture was to kind of excite us in the preparation for Ramadan, to get us excited about Ramadan. But the point is, once you're excited about Ramadan, if Allah has given you that gift of being excited, you then need to know what to do in the month to gain those virtues and to gain those blessings. You need to know how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is a problem many a time when we embark upon acts of worship, whether it be Hajj, Umrah, any type of worship, we find that many a time we don't have the information required for us to be certain to an extent, are we doing what we're supposed to be doing in the right manner? So this is the purpose of these next few lectures, is to cover the fiqh of fasting and to try to familiarize ourselves with the fundamentals of what we need to know so we can perform the acts of worship in a way that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So continuing with the book of Umdat al-Fiqh, we reach the chapter of Kitab al-Siyam, the chapter of fasting. So linguistically, fasting has a definition. The definition of fasting linguistically is imsak, which means to withhold and to abstain. This is taken from the statement of Maryam salam in the Quran when she said, Inni sawma falan insiya. She said, today I have sworn that I'm going to fast to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So I won't speak to anybody. So what did she make fasting from? Speaking. So she withheld from speaking. So that is the linguistic definition of fasting, which is to withhold. The technical definition, istilahan, the technical definition is imsak maqsus and ashai maqsusa fi waqtin maqsus min shaqsin maqsus, which is a specific withholding with intention from things which are specific, meaning the things that break your fast, in a time that is specific, meaning in the time of Ramadan, from a person that is specific, meaning the Muslim, okay? So it's a specific withholding, which is a withholding for the sake of Allah Azawajal, from specific things, meaning those things which break your fast, in a specific time, which is the time of Ramadan, from a specific person, which is the Muslim, right? So fasting was made obligatory in the second year of Hijrah upon the Muslims when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to Medina. The Imam, he says, وَيَجِبُ سِيَامُ Ramadan." Fasting of Ramadan is obligatory upon us, as we all know. This is something which is well documented, well understood. Because Allah says in the verses in Surah Al-Baqarah, كُتِبَ عَلَيْكُمُ سِيَامُ And kutiba here means it's been made obligatory upon you. Something which is made obligatory and binding upon you that you have to do. The Imam, he says, Ala kulli Muslim, upon every Muslim. So can a non-Muslim fast? A non-Muslim can fast, but he's not going to be rewarded for it, right? It's not going to be accepted from him until he enters into Islam. So a Muslim is the one who fasts and the one who is rewarded. If a person becomes a Muslim in one of the days of Ramadan, but after the sun has set, so he becomes a Muslim after Maghrib in the days of Ramadan, then all he has to do is continue fasting the rest of the month and he doesn't have to make up what he missed beforehand. But if a person becomes a Muslim in the day of Ramadan, before sunset, before iftar time, then he has to make imsak. What is imsak? We used this term just a few minutes ago. Withholding, right? Then he has to withhold from the eating and the drinking and the relationships, anything which breaks the fast. And he has to make that day up as well as continuing the rest of the month of Ramadan, okay? But many other scholars like Imam Shafi, Imam Malik, and Ibn Taymiyyah, they said this is not the case. They said if somebody didn't do that, like uh, the, the Muslim, the new Muslim, he doesn't have to make it up. Why? Because he didn't start the day fasting, so he doesn't have to end the day fasting. Okay? These are just a few things that the ulama say. The Imam, he now gives some conditions as to who from amongst the Muslims is the fasting obligatory upon. It's not every Muslim. Who amongst the Muslims is the fasting obligatory upon? So he says, Baligh and Aqil. The one who is Baligh and the one who is Aqil. And this is taken from the hadith in, collected by Ibn Majah where the Prophet ﷺ said, Rufi al-Qalam and thalath The pen has been lifted from three. Okay? Meaning the pen of responsibility, the taklif. 
عن النائم حتى يستيقظ from the one who is sleeping until he wakes up وعن الصغير حتى يكبر and from the one who is small meaning below the age of puberty until he becomes an adult وعن المجنون حتى يعقل and from the one who has lost his intellect the insane person until he regains his intellect so this hadith is proving what the imam said that there are two conditions you have to be baligh and you have to be aqil so how do we know when somebody has reached the age of balugh when somebody is baligh what are the things that tell us if he's 15 years of age very good that's one of them or the growth of the pubic hair that's another one the physical changes and another physical changes Exactly, the excretion of semen, whether it be in wet dream or whether it be in a waking state. And what is the fourth one for a woman? What do we add for the woman? Huh? The, men, the monthly cycle, the menstrual cycle, right? So whichever one of these comes first means that the person has now reached the age of balugh. And the Imam, he says, as well as these two things, qadir ala sawm. The person has the ability to fast. So if the person is too old to fast, the person is too weak, the person is sick, the person has some circumstance which doesn't allow him to fast okay say for example he's a doctor who's performing surgery and if he was to fast he'd become too weak and there's no way he can get out of that situation he can't change his timings he can't take holiday in that time then maybe in this situation the person will be exempt so the person has to be able to fast also the imam he says that the young person though he hasn't reached the age where it's now obligatory upon him to fast, he should be encouraged to fast. He should be ordered to fast if he's able to do so. Why? Because in many cultures, people are taught the fundamentals of that culture, the way of those people from an early age, because they want that person to grow up knowing his identity. They want that person to grow up knowing how to behave in that particular culture. More so for us as Muslims. Our kids, we don't leave them alone. From the age of seven upwards, we start to train them on how to be a good worshiper of Allah Azawajal. How to pray, how to fast, how to do the acts of worship if he's able to do so. Because if you train them from a young age, when they get to the age where they're supposed to do it, it will be easy for them. But if you don't train them, what's going to happen? You're going to have a rebellious child. You're going to have a child that has never tasted the sweetness of that worship or will find that worship to be very difficult. So it's important that we command the young to fast if they are able to do so, even though it's not obligatory upon them. You can make it easy for them, saying do half a day, two thirds of a day, and if they can do a full day like most children can, if you give them the opportunity, you find that children have a very strong resolve, they will be able to do it. طيب. The Imam, he says, This fasting, the time of the fasting, becomes obligatory for, from one of three things. So we spoke about who it's obligatory upon, right? Who is it obligatory upon? The Muslim, who is able, who is baligh, and who has his aql with him, right? So now the Imam, he's saying it's obligatory based upon one, one of three things, meaning the time frame. When is it obligatory to fast in Ramadan? He says, Kamal al-Sha'ban. He says, if the month of Sha'ban has com been completed. This is the, one of the things that you can look at. Because in Bukhari and Muslim, the Prophet Sallallahu said, as narrated by Abu Hurairah, Fast when you see it, meaning the moon, and break your fast when you see it, meaning the moon. But if it becomes hidden from you, then complete the month of Sha'ban 30 days. So this is one of the first signs to know that it's time for Ramadan. After 30 days of Sha'ban have been completed if you do not see the moon. The second sign that Imam says, Ramadan. And to see the, uh, the moon of Ramadan. Okay? فَمَنْ شَهِدَ مِنْكُمْ As Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah, from whoever amongst you sees the month, meaning the, the sign, the moon, then he should fast it. Taib, how do you see the moon? With your eyes, right? So there's no need for the massive technology, the, the telescopes, or whatever you use to see further into the universe, right? There's no need for that. You just look with your eyes and that suffices. But what if somebody does sight the moon using a telescope or something of that nature? Is it valid? The ulama, such as Sheikh Baz, rahimullah, he said it's valid, but it's something which is taklif, which is not required. It's something which you are, you, you are burdening yourself with, which you don't have to burden yourself with. 
Because the Prophet ﷺ clearly mentioned just a naked eye, if you see the moon, then that's what suffices. You don't need to go to the observatory and establish a multi-million pound telescope or anything of that sort. Tayyib. If the 30th night of Sha'ban is cloudy, right? Or you have a dust storm of some sort, which means you won't be able to see the moon, right? The 30th night, the Hanbali scholars, they say what you should do in this situation is based upon this hadith. Where the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمُهُ فَسُومُ وَإِذَا رَأَيْتُمُهُ وَإِذَا رَأَيْتُمُهُ فَأَفْطِرُ فَإِنْ غُمَّ عَلَيْكُمْ فَقْدِرُوا لَهُ The Prophet ﷺ said in this hadith, if you see it, then fast. If you see it, then break the fast, meaning the moon. But if it's hidden from you due to the clouds or the dust or something of that nature, then فَقْدِرُوا لَهُ Then make taqdeer of this month. This word taqdeer, okay? Now the ulama, they differ over what does this word taqdeer mean. Many of them, like the Hanbali scholars, they, they said, A, dayyikuhu, to make it limited, to make it restricted, okay? And this is taken from the verse in the Quran where Allah says, فَمَنْ قُدِرَ عَلَيْهِ رِزْقَهُ فَلْيُنْفِقْ مِمَّا آتَاهُ اللَّهُ So whoever finds that his uh, wealth has been restricted for him, restricted, then he should spend from what he's able to spend from. So they say this same meaning in this hadith. فَقْدِرُوا لَهُ The Prophet said, if you don't see the moon, then فَقْدِرُوا لَهُ means to make the month short, to make the month restricted, which means to make it 29 days. Okay? So they're saying that on the 29th night, okay, when you look out and you can't see the moon, okay, because it's cloudy or because it's dusty, then you assume that the next day is going to be Ramadan, the 30th of Sha'ban. Okay, and this is also which, what uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu used to do. It's something which some of the companions radiallahu anhum used to do, as mentioned in Abi Dawood. Okay, so this is one of the ways also, one of the opinions, especially according to the Hanbali scholars, right? The majority of the ulama, they say no. The majority of the ulama, they say don't do that. Because of the hadith that we first took, that fast when you see it and break your fast when you see it. And if you do not see it, then complete the month of Sha'ban, 30 days, okay? This is the opinion of the majority, that you just complete the month of 30 days. And they also said this, why? Because in the hadith of Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ said, or it was narrated by the companion, uh, Ammar ibn Yasir, radiyallahu anhu, man saam al yawm alladhi yashakku nas fihi, faqad asa abul qasim. Whoever fast the day, whereupon the people are not sure about, then he has disobeyed the Prophet ﷺ. So fasting the day of doubt, according to this hadith, is something which is disobe disobedient to the Prophet ﷺ. It's something which you shouldn't do. And also there's a hadith narrated by Bukhari and Muslim where the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تقدم رمضان بصوم يوم ولا يومين إلا رجل كان يسومه فليسومه That don't precede Ramadan by fasting a day or two days before it. Don't do that. The Prophet is saying don't do it. Except for a person that used to do it out of habit. That, for example, he used to fast Monday and Thursday. So it happened to be Thursday was the day before Ramadan. That person could fast. So as a summary, what our Imam is saying, he said as a summary, everything else is extra information if you can take it. Alhamdulillah, if not. The summary, what the Imam says, he said, if you see the moon, then of course you fast. He said, if you don't see the moon, then it's 30 days. Okay? That's what he said, right? And then the third situation was that if it becomes hidden from you on the 30th, then you, on the next night, on the 20th, sorry, on the 29th night, when you're looking, you can't see it, the next day you fast. This is what the Imam, he said. The Imam, he says, if you see the moon by yourself, you go ahead and fast. Because what's supposed to happen, you see the moon and then you go and tell the authorities. You tell the people in charge. If they didn't accept your witness for whatever reason, the Imam says, you go ahead and you fast. Why? Because all of that hadith, they are talking about just witnessing the moon. So if you witness the moon, you go ahead and you act upon what you witnessed, right? This is the opinion of the majority, that if you see the moon by yourself and your testimony is rejected, you should still go ahead and fast. Others like Ibn Taymiyyah, they say no, because in the hadith of Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ said, As-Sawm yawma tasumun, wal-fitr yawma tuftarun, wal-adha yawma tudahun. That the Prophet ﷺ said in Tirmidhi, that the fasting is the day when you all fast, meaning as a community. And the Eid is the day when you all 
make Eid and the breaking of the fast. So the Prophet Sallallahu in this hadith in Tirmidhi, he made it a community uh, obligation, a community act of worship. So don't do something which is away from the community. If you see the moon, don't fast. Wait till the community agrees with you or agrees on a date and go with the fasting of that day. This is the second opinion. But I said the majority opinion is like that of our Imams, that if you see the moon by yourself, you go ahead and fast, even if your testimony is rejected. The Imam, he says, فَإِن كَانَ عَادِلًا صَمَ النَّاسِ بِقَوْلِهِ If the person who witnessed the moon is just, then the people should fast according to his testimony. What else needs to be checked apart from him being just? His eyesight, of course, right? His eyesight needs to be checked and his justice needs to be checked. Those are the main things. And of course, that he is a Muslim. So then the people, they should fast with his testimony. What does it mean the people should fast with his testimony? Does it mean the people of the country? Does it mean the people of the whole world? Okay, so the majority, they said, it means the whole world, okay? So anywhere in the world where the Muslim has been corroborated that he actually has been established, that he saw the moon, then the whole world should follow his sighting. That's the majority of the opinion. The opinion of Imam Shafi is like the brother said, that it depends on the countries that share the tame, same time zones. So if the sighting in, in a variety of countries is shared, then those countries can act upon that one sighting. Otherwise, Every country can have their own sighting. And of course, the best situation, and may Allah return us to that situation, where the ummah is ruled by one authority. That is the best of situations, and that is what we ask Allah to return us to. Ameen. The Imam says, وَلَا يُفْتِرُوا إِلَّا بِشَهَادَةِ عَدْلَيْنِ And you don't stop fasting, except with the witness of two just people. How did we enter the month? How many witnesses? One. But now to leave the month, you have to have two witnesses, okay? So the witnessing for leaving the month of Ramadan to enter into the month of Shawwal requires two people. وَلَا يُفْتِرُوا إِذَا رَآهُ وَحْدَهُ And the person shouldn't stop fasting if he sees the moon of the next month, Shawwal, by himself, okay? وَإِن صَامُوا بِشَهَادَةِ إِثْنَيْنْ ثَلَاثِينَ يَوْمًا أَفْطَرُوا And if two people see the moon and they say yes that you know we have fasted 30 days or something of this sort then you can uh, stop fasting the month of Ramadan so the Imam here is saying if they started fasting the month from the statement of one person or on the day on on the day when it was doubtful due to the um, due to not being able to see the moon then they shouldn't stop fasting until they complete the period what is the period of Ramadan? 30 days, right? The period of Ramadan is 30 days, except in the situation, what the Imam mentioned, that you should fast on, the, on that day of shak. Remember we mentioned there's a day of doubt, that the opinion of the Hanbali scholars is that you should fast the day of doubt. So in this situation, if you took that opinion, you would end up fasting 31 days. Tayyip, you would end up fasting 31 days. Tayyip. There's another situation where you might fast more than 30 days. What can it be? Very good. Jazakallah khair. If you're traveling, right? So in this country, for example, you see the fast, you see the moon, they start fasting on a particular day. You go to another country, they started fasting the day after. So you're going to stay in that country till the end of Ramadan means you have to break the fast when they break the fast, which means for you, you're going to have one day extra. So you should fast with them, even though it means it's going to be one day extra. Why? Because as Prophet ﷺ said, Asom yawm tasumun. Like we said, it's a communal obligation, right? The Imam, he says, وَإِذَا اشْتَبَهَتَ الْأَشْهُرْ عَلَى الْأَسِيرْ تَحَرَّ The Imam, he's now talking about a person who's unable to determine when is it Ramadan because he's a prisoner or something of that nature. He's unable to determine when Ramadan will start. So تَحَرَّ وَصَامْ فَإِنْ وَافِقَ شَهَرْ أَوْ مَا بَعْدَهُ أَجْزَأَهُ وَإِنْ وَافِقَ مَا قَبْلَهُ لَمْ يُجْزِئْهِ So the Imam, he's saying basically this person in this situation who cannot determine when the month starts because he's a prisoner or anybody like him, then he has to exert his ishtihad. He has to try his best to discover or to figure out what month he's in. So he's, he fasts. And if his fast agreed with the month of Ramadan, then what's the ruling? It's correct, right? If he made ishtihad, he exerted his effort and he 
ended up worshipping Ramadan in the right time, the month of Ramadan, then of course it's correct. If he ended up fasting before Ramadan, what's the ruling? It's incorrect because you can only pray at a fixed time. You can only fast at a fixed time. If he ends up fasting in Ramadan and some of them outside of Ramadan, what's the ruling? Correct. Everything is correct, right? So the issue here is if he ended up fasting before Ramadan. The other situations are correct. Because if he fasts after Ramadan, it's like making qada. You know qada after salah when you have to make the salah up, when the time of the salah is passed due to a valid reason, you're allowed to make it up. Likewise, the person who's fasting. If he ended up fasting after Ramadan due to the valid reason, which was he couldn't determine when the month started, then he's allowed to make it up, uh, meaning that his fasting was correct because he fasted afterwards. The Imam now, he goes and he starts talking about something which is very important. Of course, the first part, when we were talking about when the month is established, that for us is easy. Alhamdulillah, we live in a Muslim country. We have an authority. The authority decides, we go ahead and we fast, alhamdulillah. But that's just for you to know, for those of you who have relatives living in other countries who are going to have these issues, so you can calm them down and try to clarify for them what is the issue and how easy it is with regards to the moon sighting. The Imam now, he says, Babu ahkam al-muftirin fi Ramadan. The chapter now wherein he's going to talk about those who are allowed not to fast in Ramadan, those who are exempt from fasting in Ramadan. So he says, وَيُبَاحُوا الْفِطْرِ فِي رَمَضَانِ لِأَرْبَعَةِ أَقْصَانِ Now listen to the words, right? Be careful. He says it's permitted, يُبَاحُوا It's permitted not to fast in Ramadan for four types of people. The reason I'm stressing this word because we're going to come back to it in a later point. It's permitted for four types of people not to fast Ramadan. One of these people who is permitted for them not to fast is the sick person who is going to be harmed if they fast. So what does that mean? Any type of sickness, right, that you have which harms you if you were to fast, like somebody who has type 1 diabetes, maybe for example, okay, any type of sickness which is going to harm you or is going to be prolonged in terms of its cure due to you fasting, then this person is allowed not to fast. But this has to be t- determined by a trustworthy doctor. You don't just wake up in the morning saying, I'm sick, right? I don't need to fast. You need to speak to somebody who has medical knowledge or you need to do some research. Is this a serious issue that I have? Will it affect me if I fast? Don't just make it up in your mind because you feel that the fasting days are too long for you. But in fact, there is a statement by Imam Ahmed who said that he was asked about fever, the one who has fever. Is this person exempt from fasting? He said, I don't know of anything which is more applicable for being exempt than fever. Meaning that fever is a true case of somebody exempt from fasting. So obviously it means a real fever. Uh, The person who has a fever is exempt from fasting. The point being, if there's a mushakta or if there's darar, if there's hardship, real hardship which is going to harm you, or if there's any type of sickness, then that person doesn't have to fast. The next person, the Imam, he says, The traveler, the one who is permitted to shorten the prayers. Which type of traveler is this? Is it the one going from here to Garafa? Which travel? It's the long travel, right? For at least 80 kilometers, right? So the person who is doing this traveling, once he leaves the city limits, he's allowed to break his fast, okay? If, he leaves this, if he's traveling of that distance, 80 kilometers, if he's left the city limit, he is allowed to break his fast, even though the majority, they say, if he started the travel while fasting, then he shouldn't break the fast. But those who hold that opinion, they say, even if he does break the fast, there's nothing upon him. All he has to do is make that fast back up, okay? There's no kafara upon him. So there's a variety of opinions, but in any case, they all agree that the one who's traveling, he's allowed to break the fast. But what if you're traveling for more than four days, you're going to remain in a place for more than four days. What did Sheikh Abu Hanifa and myself in previous lessons say about this situation of the one who's traveling in this situation? You're going to stay at a place for more than four days. You're not considered traveling at that time. You're traveling in the journey, but once you get to that place, you're considered to be like a muqim, okay? Not mustawtin, not the one who's permanently resident, but you're considered a muqim, and you have to pray like everyone else, and you have to fast like everyone else. That's if you were going to stay there, intending to stay there for four days or more. Tayyib. So the traveler, he has the concession not to fast, right? 
What if he wants to fast? The Prophet ﷺ was asked in Sahih Muslim by Hamza al-Aslami radiyallahu anhu, who said, قُلْتُ يَا رَسُولُ اللَّهِ أَجِدُ فِي نَفْسِ قُوَّةِ عَلَى صَوْمْ فِي صَفْرِ This companion Hamza, he said, Prophet of Allah, I find in myself the strength to fast while I'm traveling. فَهَلْ عَلَيَّ جُنَاحْ So is there any sin upon me? The Prophet ﷺ said, هِيَا رُخْصَةٌ مِّنَ اللَّهِ فَمَنْ أَخْذَ بِهَا فَحَسَنٌ وَمَنْ أَحَبَّ أَنْ يَسُومْ فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِ The Prophet ﷺ said, this is a gift to you from Allah, meaning it's a gift for you that if you don't want to fast while traveling, then don't fast. So the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever takes this gift, then that is well and good. And whoever wants to fast, then there's no sin upon him. So here the Prophet ﷺ said, if you want to fast, you find the, uh, the strength within yourself to do so, then go ahead and do it. And this is the opinion of the majority. The humbly scholars, they say no. The humbly scholars, they say he shouldn't fast. Why? They say because in the hadith, the Prophet ﷺ said, um, It's not from righteousness or piety to fast while you are traveling. It's not from righteousness or piety to fast while you are traveling. But this hadith has context. What was the context? The Prophet ﷺ came across a man that the people were shading. He had fainted or he was in a very weak situation because he was fasting while traveling. So in that situation, the Prophet ﷺ said to the person, it's not from righteousness to fast while traveling, meaning if you are truly weak and unable to fast, and it's going to harm you. Tayyip. So we said that the person has the choice to fast or not to fast. But which is better? We said there's the choice. But which is better? Many of the ulama, they say it's better for you to fast. Why? If you have the ability, they mean. If you have the ability, why? Because it's the fast of Ramadan, meaning you obtain the virtues of the month of Ramadan. And it's easier for you to remove from your dhimma, to remove from your responsibility. Rather than having to have it in life, you have to make it up later. And it's going to be difficult for you to do so. So they said, if you're able to do it, then go ahead and do it. So the Imam, he says, our Imam, may Allah have mercy upon him. He says, فَالْفِطْرْ لَهُمَّ أَفْضَلْ So the opinion of our Imam and the Hanbali scholars, they said that the fitr, to break the fast for the traveler, and the one who is sick is better, right? وَعَلَيْهِمَا الْقَضَاءِ And upon them is just to make those days up. وَإِنْ صَامَا أَجْزَأْهُمَا But if they fast, then it's okay for them to fast. Again, we put a, we, we put a rule saying that as long, it is, as long as it doesn't harm them. طيب. Now the third person that we said, يُبَاحُ لَهُ الْفِطْرِ That is permitted for them to break the fast. The Imam he says, الْحَائِدْ وَالنُفَسَاء the one who has hayd, the one who has menstrual cycle, or the one who has postnatal bleeding, for these two, they are allowed to break the fast. Now remember I stressed on those words where I said, yubahu lahum al-fitr. It's permitted for them to break their fast. Some of the ulama, they took issue with our imam using these words. Why do you think? In this, in what I've just mentioned now. No, so I'm referring to now the ha'id and the nufasa, the one who is on, in a state of menstrual uh, monthly cycle and the one who has postnatal bleeding. So the ulama, they said, many of them, they said, why did he put this in this category? It's wrong. Why? Because the one who is on the menstrual cycle, is she allowed to fast? She's not allowed to fast. So it's obligatory her, for her to avoid the fast, right? If she's on that menstrual cycle, she's not allowed to fast. And if she does so intentionally, in fact, she will be sinful. Because in the hadith, in Sahih Muslim, Mu'adha radiyallahu anha, she said, I asked Aisha radiyallahu anha, ma balu al-ha'id taqti sawm wa la taqti salah. This woman, this companion, she said, what is the situation that the women have to make up the fasts, meaning the woman who is on the menstrual cycle has to make up the fast, but she doesn't have to make up the prayer. So Aisha, our mother, said to her, ahururiyatun anti, are you... One of those who live in that place, Hururiya, which is a place where the Khawarij, the deviant sect, used to gather and used to live. She said, Lastu bi Hururiya tin la kinni asal. She said, No, I'm not from them. I'm just asking. So Aisha, she said, Radiallahu anha, Kana yusibuna dhalik fa nu'maru bi qadai sawm wa la nu'maru bi qadai salah. She said, That used to happen to us at the time of the Prophet, وسلم, the menstruating woman, and we were commanded to make up the fast and we were never commanded to make up the prayer. Okay, so the hadith is showing that the one who is on 
a situation of menstrual cycle, they shouldn't be uh, fasting. They have to make it up later. Tayyib? Tayyib, a few points on this situation of the woman who has a menstrual cycle. Uh, the woman whose blood stops after Fajr is not allowed to fast that day. Why? Her blood, her blood stops after Fajr. She's not allowed to fast that day. Why? The time is gone and she didn't have the intention, right? The key thing, she wasn't able to make the intention for fasting. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever doesn't make the resolve to fast before Fajr, then he cannot have a fast, right? So your fasting has to be every night. You have to resolve the intention before Fajr that you're going to fast the next day. Tayyib, this woman... Uh, her blood stops after Fajr. Does she have to make imsak for the rest of the day? Okay. So many of the scholars, they say, no, the Hanbali scholars say, yeah. Imam Malik and Imam, Imam Shafi, they say, no. Because going back to the principle that if you started the day not fasting with a valid excuse, and, and then that excuse goes, then the rest of the day, you don't have to fast. Okay. So this woman doesn't have to withhold. The scholars, they agree that if the woman becomes pure before, if the woman's bleeding stops before Fajr, she's allowed to fast, right? But they differ over the time frame of when the blood stops, okay? Many of the ulama, uh, like it, the Hanafis scholars, they say she had to have stopped before Fajr, the bleeding had to have stopped before Fajr, wherein there was enough time for her to make ghusl. This is their opinion, right? The majority, they said no. Why do you think the majority said no to this opinion of Imam Abu Hanifa? Because you can have the ghusl afterwards and ghusl is not a condition for fasting. Being pure in a state is not a condition for fasting. In fact, the Prophet ﷺ said, it was narrated that he used to wake up from Janaba after having relationships with his family and he would go ahead, ahead and fast and he would make ghusl afterwards. So this purity is not a condition for the fasting. Tayyib, the Imam, he says, وَإِن صَامَتَا لَمْ يُدْزِئْهُمَا this woman and the postnatal woman, the one who has menstrual cycle and the one who has postnatal bleeding, if they do go ahead and fast, then it's not going to be accepted from them. Tayyip. The Imam says the thalith, the third category of people, yubahu lahum al fitr, who it's permitted for them not to fast. The third category is now this one. Al Hamil wal murda, the one who is pregnant or the one who is breastfeeding. The one who is pregnant or the one who is breastfeeding. Why would it be permitted for these people not to fast? Exactly. They may bring harm due to the, to the child or they may bring harm to themselves. So you see that the laws in the Sharia are not like the West claim. The laws in the Sharia are full of mercy and full of compassion. And this is something we should be proud of. And it's something we should recognize as we study the Islamic laws. That when, within them, you find so much scope for compassion where Allah makes affairs easy for his slaves. So here the Imam is saying that the one who is uh, pregnant or the one who is breastfeeding, they do not have to fast. The Imam, he says, if they fear for themselves, then what they do is they break the fast. If they fear for themselves, they break the fast and they make it up at a later time. And then the Imam, he says, وَإِنْ خَافَتَا عَلَىٰ وَلَدَيْهِمَا أَفْتَرَتَا وَقَدَتَا وَطْعَمَتَا أَنْ كُلْ يَوْمٍ مِسْكِينًا But... If they fed for the child, and that's why they didn't fast, then they break the fast, they make up the fast, and they have to pay a, a fidya for every day they missed. They have to feed a poor person for every day that they missed. So in the first situation, all they had to do was break the fast, not fast, and they had to make up the fast when they fed for themselves. Now when they fed for the child, they have to, as well as not fasting and making it up, they have to pay uh, for a poor person to be fed for every day that they miss. Tayyip, what's the third possible situation? So the first one, they fed for themselves. Exactly, they fed for both of them. They fed for the child and they fed for themselves. In this situation, the ulama, they say the ruling goes back to the mother. It goes back as, as though she fed for herself. So we go back to the first situation. Tayyip, the Hanbali scholars, they say that the feeding, the fidya, the feeding is not upon the woman. It's upon the one who caused this headache in the first place. It's upon the husband, right? He's the one who has to do the feeding. He's the one who has to pay the fidya for the woman. Tayyip. The Imam, he says, Al-Rabi' The fourth. Al-Ajiz and his 
لكبر أو مرض لا يرجى برؤه. The one who is unable to fast due to being of old age, or he has an illness which he feels will never be cured. We never know, or we never truly believe that our illness will never be cured, because we always know that Allah can and will answer the du'as. But if the doctor has told you that this is an illness, an illness which will cause you harm if you fast and you cannot be cured from it, then this person is also exempt from fasting. And as we said also, the elderly person is exempt from fasting. So this person, what does he do? فَإِنَّهُ يُطْعَمُ عَنْهُ لِكُلِّ يَوْمٍ مِسْكِينَ The old person and this person who has this continual illness, then all he does is that he feeds a poor person for every day that he doesn't fast. وَعَلَى سَائِرِ مَنْ أَفْتَرَ الْقَضَاءَ لَا غَيْرِ And for everybody else who broke the fast, who was permitted to break the fast, or even if they were not permitted to break the fast, that all they have to do is to make up the fast. And if they broke the fast without excuse, they have to make tawbah to Allah Azza wa Jal. And the Imam says, إِلَّا مَنْ أَفْتَرَ بِجَمَاءَ فِي الْفَرْجِ Except for the one who broke his fast due to having relationships with his wife in the way that the man and the woman are permitted to have relationship, okay? So if he had relationships with his wife uh, in the private manner, then this person, he has a different set of rules. He has to do more than just making up the fast and more than just making tawbah to Allah Azawajal. And we will take that next week, inshallah. And whatever I have said, which is correct, is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Any shortcomings and mistakes were from myself and shaitan. If you need any clarification, if you have questions on what we've taken so far, then feel free to ask. And we will continue with the things uh, that are required from this particular person and the things that actually break the fast, what you eat, what you drink, and other situations next week by the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wa jazakumullah khair.